grab a raffle ticket. I'd like a raffle ticket. Right, so can you take one from there and pass them on? Okay. Yeah. So yeah, just take the one. Oh, wait. No, you've got to take that one. So take one of them and pass the other along. So yeah, one of those There was a joke in filibuster comics about what happens, what happened, let's see, if, about possibly getting a monarchy kill screen if you go past a certain number for Jubilee. In 2013, if the queen is still alive in 2032, it's a kill screen. Right. I don't know about that. Yeah. These are all the prizes. Hi, my name is Steve Ritchie, and uh, um, I just wanted to say this. Uh, uh, Gary Flower's a good friend and a, um, uh, a pinball aficionado and a, a very, I don't know, he's like the pin geek's pin geek. And um, I'm just really pr uh, proud to announce Gary Flower. All right, guys, I hope you'll... Bear with me. I'm trying to do something a bit different rather than just like a lecture at you about the history of pinball. What I've done is I've gone through my hard drive, which has several thousand pictures of uh, pinball-related stuff I've come across in the last 35 years. And we're going to play kind of Russian roulette. You're going to choose a number by virtue of the raffle tickets. Great. And then... Uh, I'm going to talk probably for maybe no more than three minutes on whatever picture comes up. And I'm going to try and throw in some questions. And we've got some prizes that have been donated primarily by the vendors outside, who've been very generous. Um, come up and choose something if you get the question right. And I'm not going to make them harder. Um, so what's my objectives? My objectives really are, um, it is about my journey through the world of pinball, so you will see quite a few shots of me. 
Um, I've tried to include some unusual photos, uh, maybe some photos of people where you know the name but maybe don't know what they look like. So people from the world of pinball. And I also want to show how pinball is really all around us. People think that pinball's a thing of the past, it's not alive anymore, but it, it crops up in the weirdest places. Uh, for example, in Europe right now, they're running um, a commercial for the new model Audi motor car, and they've chosen a pinball theme for it. Seems weird to me, but hey, it's pinball, so it's good stuff. Um, right, so in order to get the show on the road, I need to rip up these tickets. I hope you've all taken the right-hand one and not the left-hand one, otherwise I won't have anything to put in the hat. So, give me a second, please. This is uh, just, just an example. I came across this in my local um, candy store. New product called Pinballs. Candy. Got to win it if you want it. All right, let, let's get these raffle tickets sorted out. I should say that there are some shots of uh, partial nudity, so if you're likely to be offended by that, <laughs> Sure, come on, grab one. Anyone else need a ticket? Take, uh, take it four, four. What's give that? Me, give me, take the top one and give me down. Okay. So I've got 45 minutes. I've probably got 20 prizes, and there's probably about 20 people in the room. So we've got an extra grab of ticket. Yeah, take the one on the right and give me the one on the left. Right down here. Number you got? Yep, that's there right. we go. Yeah. What number have you got? Missing. Okay, let me put those Can we get the two numbers? Sure. As long as it's 448. That was a joke. Come on, guys. Well, pay So I need a number from you up to 74. Yeah. 36. Yeah. Uh, 62. 62, right, let's see how this works. Because I don't know what's going to come out either. So, uh, but you get first chance at any question. You can take the number. Okay, that's me. Um, that was at a pinball event held in Cambridge, the university town. And uh, the guy that put on the show um, approached his local pub uh, to say he wanted to do a pinball show. And not only were they very cooperative, they let the brewery know, and the brewery um, made out a special beer for the event called Pinball Wizard. And it's called Pinball Wizard. And by all accounts, it was a great beer. <laughs> <laughs> Do I read the business? Yeah, that's fine. I'll tell you what, let that guy choose the next number. What kind of beer was it? Was it I don't beer? drink the stuff. I'm uh, sorry. I, I, <laughs> bizarrely, lighter, I, darker. I drink bourbon, if anything. <laughs> <laughs> This is very, very rough artwork done by Dave Christensen for um, a game. Do you have the microphone? 
Okay, this, this is preliminary artwork done by Dave Christensen uh, for a game, Spirit of 76. It never actually went into production. I wonder why. There's been quite a lot of um, Dave Christensen artwork that hasn't made it into production, and there's also been some that has and maybe shouldn't have done if the, the bosses at the company saw some of the details. Okay, and uh, next number. Dave did, yeah. Yeah, Greg Kamek designed the game. Uh, wh one of the things while we're talking about that that not a lot of people know is uh, pretty much on every game that Greg Kamek did, there's one odd colored post. Does anyone know the story behind that? Okay, well it seems that w one of the first games he made, they actually ran out of white posts and he had to use a red post off of a bingo machine. And since then, every, um, Every game that Greg has designed, even the one for Capcom, have had that red post on. And going back to my early days of collecting pinball machines, when I got a Captain Fantastic, I saw the one red post, never been to the States, never knew the story, never met Greg. So, of course, I changed it for a white one. And I had a look on the Captain Fantastic that's out on the floor, and I couldn't see the red post. I think it should be on the top right-hand side. So there you go. Next number. Uh, four, three, two. Come on, we need, I need a chance to answer your question. Okay. Come on, I'll ask you a question then. Um, who cho you chose 42. Can you name either of the people in that photograph? Okay. Now, the, uh, the story behind that, you're, you're quite right. I believe the guy on the left um, uh, is Geraldo. Um, come on, choose a prize. Um, the guy on the right is the pinball person, and that's Dick Pouchel, who's not, not with us anymore, but he really is the ultimate pinball historian. Um, you know, my interest in pinball really goes back to the games of of the 60s onwards, so not that great if you go back beyond that. But he really, I wouldn't say dedicated his life, but he went for every detail of, of the really old stuff. He was terrific at it. And, you know, of course, you can still learn that stuff. His books are still available. So if you're really interested in the older games, he's the man you should look out for. There's actually a wealth of information that he... Um, collected that has not been published, and I believe that that rests with uh, Steve, Steve at Pinball Resource. The last name escapes me. Young? Steve Young, right. So, uh, and the intention is that someday there'll be more books in his history series published. Okay, I think I've got uh, four, five, five. Did you get your prize? You did, good. Okay. So uh, that uh, was donated by uh, Planetary Pinball. So you have to go and tell them you got that because they think all this stuff that I uh, asked for is going on eBay. So, uh. okay. By the way, if you win a prize and your cell phone goes off, you have to give it back. Okay, another example of um, how pinball turns up in the most unexpected places. This is um, a CD that came out not that long ago. It's retro, it's uh, back to the 90s, and of course, they've got pinball artwork on the cover. Next number. Are you too quick for me? It's so small, we don't see it come out the front. 434. Four. So who's got 434? Four, Okay. Does anyone know who that is? For a prize? Sorry, number the, the guy that chose the number. Okay. No. That's Aaron Spelling. 
and uh, uh, one year his wife uh, wanted to get him something a bit special for his birthday, so she commissioned Stern to come up with a pinball machine for him. Uh, the machine has been displayed several times at Pinball Expo, and you probably can't see it from, from there, but the artwork reflects all the projects, all the TV series that he was involved with. So what do you think of it so far? Okay. I'll, I'll, I'll stick while I'm winning. So 434 is the next number. Uh, who's got 434? Oh, okay. Okay, so... I probably, sh I probably should delete these as I go, so we know. Okay, there you go. Advert for compact computers. Mind you, I've seen a few operators that do repairs like that. Once I bought uh, William's game, Pharaoh. I don't know if you know that game. It's one of the uh, multi-level series that included Black Knight. I'm going to forget one of them. Black Knight, Solar Fire, Pharaoh. What was the fourth one? No, no, I can't remember. Prize, prize up for grabs here. Jungle Lord, Jungle Lord get, a, get a prize, yeah. Okay, and um, there was a kick out source from the left hand side and obviously the solenoid or something had uh, broken, I can't remember what it was. I just whacked a great big nail in there so the ball couldn't go in the saucer. <laughs> okay, Thank you. there's two of those. They're, um, they're passes to get into the uh, Pinball Museum in Seattle. So that's where the, the vendor that gave us those. Okay, next number. 437. Okay, I need a number from you. Uh, seven. Seven. Okay. Okay. This is, this is the Bally Brain, once again. Um, this is for real. This is early prototype stuff for Bally going solid state. Um, I'm trying to think what game they put it in. I think it was Bow and Arrow that um, they used just to, to kind of mess around and develop the idea. Um, but of course, they, they didn't use that. Uh, number 447. Give us a number. Five. Okay, this is an Italian game. I guess you don't see many, uh, many of these over here. It is on IPDB. Um, I should say something about IPDB. Is Jay in the room? No, Jay, Jay Stafford, who is at the show, he is the man that is responsible not just for putting the stuff on IPDB, but he works very hard to actually validate the information. And he won't just put something on there because you or I tell him that so-and-so designed it or so-and-so came up with this. He, w he needs hard evidence to, to put the stuff up there. So uh, I think it's a marvelous resource that we all have to draw on. How many of you have used IPDB? Can I see? Right, so I don't need to say too much about it. Okay. Next number, 433. Three. Okie dokie. Haha, we don't have a number 14, did you know that? I don't know what happened to that, but there you go. I think you should get a prize for that. Go on. Another number? Do you want to come and get a prize anyway? Oh, come on. Come on. Yeah. Okay, I need another number. I'm, I'm, I'm actually seeing there's quite a few gaps here. I used a new bit of software that I hadn't used before, and it's just supposed to go through your presentation and allocate numbers to your slides, because obviously I had titles in there, and I didn't want you to see what the titles were. So um, I didn't, uh, I only got this a couple of days ago. Okay, but we have got 74 numbers. Can you give us another one, please? Go on. I've got a question. There's no prize, but 
Who, who do you think uh, donated the T-shirt? That's Marco. I don't know if you buy from Marco, but I guess these are the adverts. But they're lovely people, and uh, they provide a great service, and they're out there. And I don't think they're even selling anything. That's, uh, that's amazing. Okay, that's a very old photo. I couldn't tell you what year. That's actually me on the left. Um, and on the right, come on, for a prize, who's the guy on the right? You get first shot because you chose the number. Who's the guy on the right? No, I need a name. All right, throw it open to anyone. Dennis Norman. Okay, come on, grab yourself a prize. I'm trying to think what the game was that would have been around. I've got a feeling that that would have been about the time of Whitewater. 92, okay. There was, I can tell you where it was taken. It was taken at Pinball Expo. I tell you, it wasn't Jim Shelberg. He's better than that. Okay, next number, 446. Okay. okay, oops, more nipples. Sorry about that, everyone. Um, okay, I'm not, I'm not going to, I'm sure you'll recognize that it's Dave Christensen up there. And this would have been. This photo would be no newer than 1986, I would imagine. And uh, basically, they used to get up to quite a few stunts back in Bali um, in the old days. Um, this was a game called Twin Win. Um, couldn't tell you the year, probably about 75. Uh, 1980, no, it would have been solid state if it was 1980. So... Uh, I'm going, to say, I'm going to say 75, unusual game. I do actually remember playing this in a bar in England. Um, and what was unusual about it, I don't know how many of you know the playfield layout, but it was a pretty bare playfield layout, except for two features. One was the spinning disc that we'd seen previously on Fireball. And then all the targets were at the top end of the playfield. And I believe it had four flippers. I'm testing my memory here. But... Uh, the, the pair in the conventional position and two, about two thirds of the way up the play field on the extreme left and extreme right. And in the production model, the young lady had a bikini top on, but um, evidently there was a technique where you could scrape off the paint and uh, do, a, do a hand job. So, uh, so uh, and that one's actually in, uh, the Lord of the Silver Ball, if any of you have got a copy of that. Okay. 74. Okay. Oh, 75. Off the top of my head. Come on. There's a lot of stuff in there and a lot of stuff I can't even get to in anymore. Next number is 444. Who's got 444? Not me. Okay, Jay, can you give us a number up to 74, please? Jay snuck in here. We've just been singing your praises. You weren't in the room at the time, were you? Okay. Why were you late? Get out. Okay. Okay, can you give us a number up to 74? Please. And um, what would it be? That's right. Come and get a prize. So, so sometimes my sense of humor doesn't work with you American guys. Uh, no, nope, we haven't got 36. You have to give it back. Sorry. Another, try again. 44. How appropriate. Okay. Okay. So, come on, Jay. You get another chance of winning a prize. Easy question for you. Can you tell the folks who that is in the photo? I'll give you a clue. Ex Williams employee, now working for, if I remember correctly, Leading Edge Design. All right, I'm going to throw it open. Duncan, Duncan Brown. Okay, come and grab a prize. Um, I guess you've got a head start. Do you know what, what he was doing in that photo? 
Right, he's, he's, cat he's taking high quality photographs of every back glass he can find. And the next number is? 431. Okay, so a number please. 23. Okay, that, that's just a cute photo that I've acquired somewhere. It's uh, um, just uh, an establishment in, in Milwaukee. Something brown. <laughs> right, but there, there's a pinball machine in the window. That's the... Uh, the right, right. Okay, uh, another number please. Four, four, one. Thirty-one, have we had thirty-one? No, we haven't, okay. That's, uh, that's a game that was never made, at least not in that form. Can you recognize what it, what it is from the playfield layout? No, it's not. It was made, but it wasn't made as Batman. Prize up for grabs? Police force. Yeah. Now, I can't verify this, but the story I was told is that uh, Williams uh, thought they were buying the license to make Batman, but during negotiations, for, for reasons that I, I won't go into, the license moved over to the people at uh, Data East or whatever they were calling themselves that week. And, uh, and they, they actually produced the Batman game and uh, that game became an easy question, but we've, we've had the answer, it became police force. So, yeah. And by the way, no disrespect to, uh, to uh, Data East. I just, I, I, in my head, I can't remember the dates. They evolved from Data East into Sega into what they are today, Stern Pinball Inc. And the next number, 436. Well, look, I, uh, I How did that happen? I accidentally took more than one. How many have you got in there? Unfortunately, th unfortunately three. Oops, gone. We'll let you get, get away with it this time. <laughs> Sneaky. What number are you going to choose out of those on the... Up there. 43. Okay, I can see a system here. Oops! <laughs> okay, uh, this is, uh, I guess this is just life imitating art. There's not, not a lot I can say about it other than it was taken somewhere in Michigan. <laughs> um, do, do we have the photographer in the room? I don't know. I really don't know. Do we? Yeah, we do. Okay. So, uh, another number, please. Yeah, there's a whole series. <laughs> four, four, two. Okay, 18. Uh, we've had number 18, sorry about that. Try again. I'm gonna delete them as we go now, just. Okay, that's just uh, random stuff I came across, a work of art. Um, <laughs> not a lot I can say about it. The, ga the game is obviously Playboy and it's obviously being decorated um, with kind of a skirt and it's got fancy legs, in both one in each corner and the two facing forwards. Um, uh, well, Playboy would have been about 79, 80. Um, so since then. <laughs> Pardon? Uh, not as far as I'm aware. It was interesting. I was doing some research um, on one of the photos that might come up. And I, I learned something. It's a pinball artist. But when I was doing the research, I discovered that um, he also did sculpture. In fact, one of his pieces was displayed as a piece of street art. In, in New York City. 
and that's not pinball related other than the fact the artist. Um, and in fact, when the guy, well, I'm telling the story and we haven't had the photos, but when the guy left the wonderful world of pinball, he went on to become a, an artist that some would say w w was more serious. I guess at the end of the day, pinball is a kind of commercial art or industrial art. Um, and he moved on, you know, he got an agent and his stuff went into galleries and so on. <laughs> no comment. I, I, th I think you can have up to four on that one. Uh, another number, please. Four, four, three. Okay, um, that's one of the guys that's at this show. Uh, the guy that chose the number gets first go. Who chose the number? Who chose? Right, do you know who that is? Come, oh, come on, try harder. All right, it, it's Gene Cunningham, and that's his day job. So, for a prize, and we'll, we'll stick with you for the moment, uh, what is his day job, or what was his day job when that was taken? No good waving frantically at me. Pardon? Right, close. But it, is it a roller rink? Or is it ice? It's roller. It's roller. Okay, another prize. Come and have another. All right. Not compulsory, not compulsory. All right, another number, please. Four, three, five. Okay, another number, please. Read. Fifty-four. Okay, another another example of pinball. I don't know. Uh, did the Zootons make it over here? They were quite big in England for a while. Um, but their album cover. Funnily enough. Um, I actually saw them perform live as a support band for The Who in, in Hyde Park. And um, the backdrop to the stage when they were on it was um, this artwork in, in a massive form. And uh, obviously, this is certainly in the last 10 years, they've gone very retro on the pinball theme. Okay, and that was the last number, was it? Okay. Right. I'm going to find an excuse to try and give away some more prizes, unless you've had enough. Well, just, just give us a number. 40. 40. <laughs> Don't tell me the missing numbers have turned up. They've all, they're all there, they weren't in order for some reason. The missing numbers have turned up. So here's, okay, here's, here's one of my favorite stories. Come on, open down. Okay. Try a different one. All right. I'm gonna, I'll, close, I'll close it down already open and try again. No, that's not it, but if someone can tell me who that is standing next to me on the, on the left, that's me in Wayne Morgan. Oh, come on. Come and get a prize. Do you know what he does for a living? All right. I'm going to make it tougher for you. If you want a prize, you've got to tell us the name of the show he put together, the exhibit he put together, that was pinball related. Are you right? Yeah, that's right. Right. Okay. Come and get come and get a prize then. Come on. Okay, yeah, that's why Morgan. That photo would have been taken in eighty five or eighty six. No idea. So uh Anything. That's uh, a rare collectible autograph by Walter Day. Oops. 
There she is again. That's probably why it wouldn't open up that to me. Okay. Say that again, Jay. Um, well, Wayne Morgan was the curator of the exhibit. That was his title. Okay. We can talk about that later because I've got a little bit more information. Okay, well, can we go to number 40, please? I think it's number 40. No, just... Can use the cursor in the future, because otherwise it shows all the ones in between. Right, sorry. It does not want to show them, does it? All right. Let's close it down. And go to Seattle. I've lost the whole lot. Can you see with the Seattle folder yeah, now? Yeah, It's American. It doesn't like that one. It doesn't, does it? Let's try 39. It won't open anything. That is weird. Why won't it open anything? All right, we've got 11 open. Let's close those. There we go. Okay, can you make it full screen? Right, this, um, this is... I just can't get how many coincidences have cropped up in my life that have worked in my favour. The story here is normally my routine is I go out for coffee every morning, I sit down in the, uh, uh, the cafe and they, they have the daily papers and uh, I, I pick up the times and I do the crossword. That's my normal routine. This was pretty much the first time in two years that I'd got there and someone else had beaten me to the newspaper. So. I, the newspaper that I chose to look at was, was the Daily Mail. And on Tuesdays, they have a pull-out section called Female, which is um, women's stuff. And on this particular occasion, um, they had a fashion article about the, res the return of the micro miniskirt. And this was the photo they used to illustrate it. And uh, I saw this, and a chill ran down my spine. And uh, it said in the, in the caption where the photograph was taken. And it was a, a coffee shop in Soho in London, uh, around the corner from where a friend of mine worked. So I rang him up, I said, can you pop round there and see if they want to sell their pinball machine? <laughs> and uh, anyway, he decided he was too busy. And I just thought like every pinhead in town, if not the country, would be bringing up the number of this place trying to buy the game. So I, di I did nothing about it. Six months later, I was in the neighbourhood. I walk in there, the pinball machine is still there. And not only that, it's got the operator's phone number on it. S so I ring up the operator and I uh, said, uh, I've just seen, seen your medieval madness, I'd like to buy it. It was, it was filthy. Um, and uh, he said, well, how much are you going to give me for it? And I thought, you know, you always start low, don't you? I, I missed the seminar on buying games, but uh, I'm sure they said start low, you can always go up. So I made him a stupid offer. And he said, well, I need to speak to my um, workshop guy because he's the one that knows the value of these things. I'll phone you back tomorrow. A week goes by, no call. So I think, oh, all right, he's realised I've low bored him. I phone up again. Uh, he said, oh, I forgot all about it. I'll go. Uh, so I'll speak to my guy, I'll get back to you tomorrow. A week goes by. This went on for six months. I'm chasing him and I'm off to China because my main business is making pool tables and I'm going there to buy some, some felt to cover. You know, or I'm playing golf at the moment, I can't, can't deal with this. And then out the blue, after six months, he phones me and says, do you still want to buy that game? I said, well, yeah, if the price is right. He said, well, you can have it for what you offered me for it. <laughs> now the problem is I can't remember what I offered him for it. <laughs> so um, I, I asked him to remind me, and 
it was some stupid amount, like uh, 600 bucks. And, uh, and he said, you can have it for 600 bucks, but you've got to come and get it today. I said, well, I don't have a problem with the money. I can get my hands on the money today, but I, I don't have any transport. So he said, well, I'll get my guys to drop it off at your place. Where do you live? So it's fine. I said, uh, I'll tell you what, I'll meet your guys there. I'll give them the money and I'll help them load it up. My, my agenda was I wanted to supervise so it didn't get damaged. Anyway, I get round there. Their, their car, their, their van, their truck, whatever you want to call it, their vehicle had been clamped because it had parked illegally. That's a $250 fine in London. Anyway, they loaded up the game, they brought it round, and I had the game a few years, and then I sold it on. Um, it was, um, it had one bulb working on the play field, and bizarrely, it was in the most inaccessible place. It was the uh, bumper on the right-hand side, um, underneath the ramp, and uh, it had one bulb working in the, in the head of the game as well. Um, but what, what, a, what a game. And by the way, I did track down the photographer as well and asked him if he had any more shots because all I had was the newspaper cutting and um, he gave me some story about how he'd thrown away all his uh, negatives or whatever after he'd been paid, which I think is extremely unlikely, but hey. Um, this was on a road trip. I think this was in Toronto. I came across this place. Sad, but, you know, where are the arcades gone? I don't know what it's like um, in your localities, but it, even in the centre of London, there's just a handful of places. And when I say a handful, I can probably, off the top of my head, I could only come up with two places in London to play pinball right now. Play to win. Play to win doesn't have any games in it any, anymore. Um, they had one hour ago. Right, right. And the Crystal Rooms was a great... I remember... I was quite young. It was a long time ago. Standing there almost with my face pressed up up against the window and uh, They probably had 20 or 30 games. I remember Going in there and playing Sea Witch from Stern and being blown away by the sounds on it. It's a terrific game um, And I can remember years before that there was an arcade in King's Cross Which probably had a row of maybe 20 EM games and I used to go in there and play Apollo was 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 my favorite game in there Lovely when you make the shot straight up the center and the game's set up right, so you go over all the rollovers and hit the target right at the top. Okay, next. Okay, there's a small story there. I can't, this, this is a game I've got today. Um, I, I think I got this off eBay for like five bucks or something. It's a, to give you an idea of scale, it's probably at least 30 inches long. But what's intriguing about it is it's made out of Bakelite, which is an early form of plastic. Um, I've just got it for ornamental purposes. It's in very nice condition, probably made in the 50s. I, there's actually a Bakelite museum in, um, in England, and I've spoken to them about it. And they would like it. OK. Who's this guy? Prize, prize up, big prize? Two prizes. All right. This is the guy I was telling you about before, referring to before, Christian Marsh. Um, he's often known as the artist responsible for pointy people. Um, but I think, off the top of my head, that uh, tribute goes to Jerry Kelly. Um, because if you look at most of this guy's catalogue, um, it just doesn't seem consistent with pointy people, so I think he was probably told to copy that style. I don't know, Jay, have you got any view on that from your research? Yeah, yeah, me too. But there's, so anyway, this, this guy died about three years ago living in Corsica. He's the guy that did the sculpture in New York that went on to become a fine artist. Um, and this is some of his work, and actually that photo was provided by Rob Burke, who, who does Pinball Expo. But... Um, I will give a prize. Uh, it's probably a tough question if you didn't know who it was, but uh, and I think I've got to exclude you, Jay, if you don't mind. No offence, because you, 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 all these answers have been through your head. Um, but my question is: He did the artwork for 
the game that Steve Kordak is proudest of. So you don't need to know the artist, you need to know the game that Steve Kordak is, is most proud of. And, and uh, can I ask you to put up your hand if you haven't won a prize? We'll give those people a chance first. The guy in the green shirt. Sorry, wrong. Come on, I know you're desperate. What? No, I, I want to know the name of a game. No, it's, it's a back glass that hung in Steve Cordek's office at Williams for many years. Oh, I can tell you it's an electromechanical space mission, yeah. Okay, grab a prize. Uh, 2009, March. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, Steve Cordek, yeah. Sorry, I was talking about um, Christian Marsh. Oh, yeah, no. Yeah. Okay, so talking to Steve Cordek, can we get that full screen? There you go. Um, this was a tribute to Steve, um, pretty much, I want to say signed exclusively, but most of the people that signed it uh, worked with Steve uh, Williams. And I know he's very proud of, proud of this. Okay, what'd you get? Right, those were, right, respect to coin taker. Okay, next. I don't know if we can blow that up so we can read any of the comments. What do you think, Jim? Back one. Just try and get one of the comments out. Okay. Let, let me see if I can give you some of the names of the people that have signed it. So I can see Pat Lawler's signature, uh, Jim Sherd. Do you know who Jim Sherd is? He's a great guy. He was responsible at Williams for all the wiring harnesses. And today he still provides those wiring ha harnesses for collectors. Uh, yeah. Some of these signatures are not easy to read. Right, there's Greg. Greg. Greg's a local boy, local to Seattle, but I think he's now working in Scandinavia somewhere. Went out there a couple of years ago. Okay. Right, uh, Vince is a, a sound guy. Okay, let's, let's move on to the next slide, which is Gordon Morrison. Gordon Morrison, very prolific in the world of art. Um, not, not exclusively for Gottlieb, but he did a lot of the Gottlieb stuff um, from... Oh, oh. I can't think, um, but his style off the top of my head. I mean, I've got a counterforce, which is him. It, it looks psychedelic, a lot of his artwork, although he tells me he never did drugs. Um, uh, Jim and I actually had the pleasure of visiting him at his house, and pretty much all his wall space was covered with glasses that he'd, he'd done. And um, the sad thing is he passed away sometime in the last... I was going to meet up with him a couple of weeks before... Um, couple of in, when I came out to Expo and a couple of weeks before he passed away and when his family sort of were sorting out the house they just got a dumpster and put all the glass in the dumpster it was all like NOS it was glasses for games that had never been made there was a very interesting glass um, for a stern game that, that never went into production nice guy in fact um, just a few weeks before he died of cancer he um, was the oldest guy to complete the Chicago Marathon. So, This um, is a nightclub uh, that provided me with photos. I read in the paper that a new nightclub had opened up in Bristol in England and the um, inside had taken pinball as a theme for its decoration. And, and this is what they sent me. Okay. Hands up if you haven't won a prize. Keep your hand up if you know who that is. Okay, uh, this this is John Yowsey. Um, uh, did artwork for games such as uh, Funhouse. In fact, a lot of Pat Lawler games. And what you can see in his hand is uh, originally it wasn't going to be called Funhouse. At one stage, it was going to be called Crazy House. That's right. That's right. Okay, this, uh, 
this really, the story behind this is something you can do to promote Pinball, something I did anyway. Um, Elvis was coming out, and I thought, yeah, what can we do about this? I, I got in touch with the uh, distributor in London, and I persuaded him that uh, to take over uh, an American-themed diner in London to promote the Elvis Pin Table. So we got a couple of games down, and he got a couple of girls along, and I think there were motorbikes there, and an Elvis impersonator. And basically, we had a party. Um, and he invited people in the trade and, and pinheads, and we had a good time. And so maybe that's something you can do if there's a theme that, that you think you'd like to get involved with, is get in touch with your distributor and try and get him to do something to promote pinball. Okay, this is probably, what's that gonna be? That's gonna be in the 60s. This was a distributor in, um, in England, and that was the games in the showroom. And that, uh, yeah? And I can tell you how I came by that. One of the uh, trade newspapers was having a clear out and they said, we've got some old pinball photos. Would you like them? And I said, yes. And they put them in an envelope and sent them to me. Okay, this is a, a recent coin-op trade show in England, but this is uh, pinball as a theme on a, on a slot machine. And um, I pretty much go to the show. It's the ATEI amusement trades exhibition, and then they tag the eye on and call it international. And um, in fact, it's kind of split up now. It used to be mainly um, amusement machines and pin tables, and over the years I've been attending, the, the arcade stuff has diminished, so it's pretty much all casino stuff. And now the, the arcade stuff is held as a, a separate show. And Every year there's some kind of uh, slot machine that's got a pinball theme. And in fact, it's held in January. This January, the, the game I found that had the pinball theme was by IGT. Um, and I don't know if you're aware, but Joe Kamenkow, who was head of design at Data East, and he left just as it became Sega, he went to work for IGT. And um, it's quite an interesting slot machine because one of the features was you actually got to, to shoot a virtual pinball machine. You got to operate the plunger, and that affected your winnings. Uh, well, OK. Here, here, here's a question. Hands up if you haven't won a prize. Keep them up if you know where you can play this game. The guy in the hat. You haven't got a hat on, you know. Right, and that is where? And the address is? <laughs> Tropicana. East Tropicana. East Tropicana? Okay. I, I haven't been there. Come and grab a, grab a prize. Well, you better come, come, come and grab that bally hat that's on the table. Come. Okay, that. Okay. Um, there was actually two of these machines. And the other one is in a secret location, which only a very few people know about. Who Do we know who the designer is? Oh. At the back? Python. Python. Come and grab a prize. OK. Just, just out of curiosity, if you've played it, raise your hand. All oh, right. Wow. OK. Yeah, yeah. Th there's actually two. Uh, and I've seen them side by side, and there aren't going to be many people that have done that. And um, they had different flipper configurations. Um, I think, I think, as I recall, the the, um, the one in Vegas now has two flippers on the right-hand side. Can anyone clarify that? Have you? Okay. Um, the interesting thing uh, on the other one is it had a flipper that was operated by a foot pedal. So. Oh, it's multi-level. It's quite, quite intriguing. Okay. There was, um, b bizarrely, the B BBC on their world service uh, recently uh, covered the world of pinball and it included this game. And given that it's the British Broadcasting Corporation, um, the website was not available to people in Britain, which was a, a little bit bizarre. 
Okay, here's another one. This one's courtesy of Amazon. This is gay porn, <laughs> called, called, called Pinball Wizard. And uh, I just downloaded the, the sleeve off of uh, the website. <laughs> That's my story and I'm sticking to it. Okay, this is, uh, okay, if you haven't won a prize, hand in the air, give you a chance here. Uh, I'd like to know the name of the artist before Jim puts it on the screen. Any offers? All right, I'll make it easy for you. The artist is Stanford Coker. Um, and uh, how many of you subscribe to the Pin Game Journal? How many of you got uh, this year's calendar? I think it's just come out. <laughs> the, the 2012 calendar. Right. We have a prize here. For someone who hasn't won a prize yet, that, that stands our work on the front of the calendar. If you can tell me uh, the game that he's best known for, you get the calendar. Capcom game. No, not Elvira. No. Come on. <laughs> I'm embarrassed. Big bang bar. Sorry, you miss out on the calendar. Um, but if you want to see, his artwork's terrific. Um, and uh, he, he's done some interesting sketches for, what was Greg's game? Break Shot. He did um, artwork for Break Shot. Um, it, it wasn't used in the end, but it, it was based on uh, cre uh, people from Greek mythology. I believe last I heard Gene Cunningham owned that artwork. Can't, uh, okay, we need that larger. I had a random image that I found somewhere. It's obviously a homemade pinball machine uh, for people that like barbecued food. Uh, smoking hours. I, I really don't know. I just found that picture on the internet somewhere, I think. Uh, the next one, this is a, a bar in Switzerland uh, that's got old pinball machines that, that's actually making the bar that they serve on, and they're all hooked up. It's, not, it's been done elsewhere and with variation. I was in a bar earlier today that uh, the tabletops were play fields. Yeah, yeah, funny you should say. Yeah, walking distance, it really is, isn't it, Jim? <laughs> it's, oh, come on. We walk there in about 20 minutes. It's, I guess you're Americans. Uh, yeah. Okay, this was a photograph taken for a re review of Popeye. Um, it was uh, a British pinball magazine and they wanted to do an in-depth review of Popeye. And we actually put the game in someone's swimming pool and got in there with the snorkel and flippers and a camera and took some photos. There's another uh, example of British pinball eccentricity. Uh, that, that's a clock that actually works and uh, is made from a Bally score display. It's John Smout. Who is a regular contributor to the Pin Game Journal? Oh, well, regular subscribers. <laughs> day, day one subscribers. One of the 13. Is that... Uh, Oh, your your name should be in issue 150 when you get it. Then as a, I'm a right, right. No. Okay, who's the guy in the photo? <laughs> yeah. How hard was that? Do you know why I'm showing you the photo? Uh, the article tells about how he made his fortune, and it says like at the age of 13, is he had an income from operating three pinball machines. They've got many shareholders. I don't know them all individually. Really? Right. Okay. Okay, thanks for that. Um, oh, right. I've actually got a video clip to back this one up, but I won't be showing it. How are we doing for time, by the way? We're over. Are we? Okay, well, I guess we're last. Yeah, we're, we're running over. Okay. 
I guess I'll just stop now and then I get to keep all the prizes. Um, it's a pinball machine called uh, Yellow Submarine. Um, so it's Beatles. It was, it was featured on TV recently um, where they, it was, um, there's a program on TV, I don't know if you have anything similar over here, it's called Four Rooms, and basically you turn up with something unusual, there's four dealers, you can decide what order to see them in, and uh, if you reject their offer, you can take it to the next person and see if you can get a better deal, but if you accept their offer, then it stops there. And this guy turned up with this yellow submarine pinball machine, claiming it had been made to promote the Beatles movie Yellow Submarine. The problem was that I think Yellow Submarine came out in about 67, and this game was clearly made in the mid-70s. Um, and what else can I tell you about it? I happened to, supposedly, he claimed it was one of three that was made, but I'm pretty sure it was the same one that turned up at a pinball show a few years earlier and was offered for $1,000. He sold it um, to a woman who said she knew someone who would buy it, um, and I think he took about, I'm trying to convert it from pounds to dollars, around about $3,000. And uh, the woman said she'd have, she'd have paid five, six, seven thousand dollars $7,000 for it. It's based on a European-made game. And uh, as I say, the company that made it, uh, I say made it, I think it's probably a conversion that someone's done. Um, and the company didn't come into existence to the 70s. So Jim, you're walking off. Does that mean we're done? Okay. All right. So I guess we're done. All right. Well, thank you for your time. I hope you've been entertained. Um, thank you.